So we're going to begin. We're holding chapter 86 and 87, Pei Vav and Pei Zayin. Pei Zayin is very short, but a very important one. Chapter 87, very interesting one. The segula for chapter 86 is Linatzel Meruach Ra'a, someone who's being uh, tormented by an evil spirit. There's all kinds of evil spirits around. And it could be something that is uh, identified today by psychologists as schizophrenia. That's what they identify it as, because they're not really sure what is tormenting someone, what is he suffering from. But it could be some sort of evil spirit, something that is in the mind that is tormenting. So this pedic is a good chapter to say for those individuals who are having a hard time with it, struggling with some sort of evil spirit. Chapter 87, the Sigula for 87, is in order to help out a community or to help out a particular city that is in great need of some sort of help. Chapter 86 may sound familiar to you because it talks about prayer, but the difference between this chapter and other chapters is that he tells us, David Abelach actually in this chapter, that it's important to know how to pray. It's not just words, it's not just turning to Hashem and believing in Him, which is of course important, but there has to be some integrity on man's part. You can't just pray to Hashem and expect anything if the individual himself is not clean from sin, is not completely sincere, is not really focused on the prayer, and it also depends what he's asking for. If he's asking to win the lottery, mm -hmm. You know, who's to say that that is something that he should get or deserves? So you have to know what to ask, how to ask. So, so some additional details that may not have been mentioned in the past are included in this chapter. So if you pay close attention to the words, you will see that David Melech, this prayer to David, is asking Hashem, to turn your ear, not that Hashem has an ear, but it, it is figurative, so to pay close attention and answer me, for I'm, I'm poor and I am needy. Ani ve'evyon. Is he really poor? Is he really needy? So that already tells you something about his prayer, that he's including himself as a poor man. And the reason for that is because the prayer of the poor is more readily heard by Hashem. Those who are in distress, those who are in pain, those who have no one to turn to, the orphans, the widows, the poor, as the Torah mentions, Hashem will speak up for them. So He is including Himself with these people, even though He's not exactly a poor man, but He considers Himself as such. Why would He consider Himself as a poor man? Because he's aware that perhaps he may not have so many merits, so he's poor in merits. He may not have too many good achievements to count on and to uh, rely on in asking Hashem for favors. So this is, I may be poor and I am needy. I'm in need of your favor, of your graciousness. After all, that is what a poor man does. He asks for favors. He asks for help. And the importance of this is to remind us that even if someone may have sinned, may have done something wrong, it does not mean he can't pray. It doesn't mean he shouldn't pray at all. On the contrary, part of the prayer will include, as we will soon see, a sincere remorse for the past. That will make this individual called a Hasid. There are different interpretations for the word Hasid, but one of them is that he confesses, he admits his wrongs. You know, it's imagine a husband telling his wife, listen, I'm, I'm asking you to do this for me, I'm asking you a favor, and I admit that I'm not, I wasn't the best person, I didn't treat you right. So he's admitting it, he's even bringing it up, he's not ashamed to do so. And it counts, I think, many women would agree that if the husband were to address his wife this way and, and, and 
admit the fact that he may not have been such a good husband, or perhaps he doesn't deserve this favor that he's asking, it means a lot. It means that he's coming out in the open and sincerely expressing his remorse from the past and realizing that he may not receive what he's asking for, but at the very least he can try. So, very similarly, when we are asking for, his, for Hashem's help, we must realize that perhaps this is not coming to us, maybe we don't deserve it. It all depends on what it is exactly that we're asking and uh, what the situation is all about. Is it something physical in nature or something spiritual? As we will soon see, there is a great difference between a spiritual request and a physical request. A physical request meaning you're looking to um, buy a home. Can't find a good house. That's, that's something physical in nature. A job, it's physical. But spiritual means give me the strength to do battle with the evil inclination. Give me the strength to overcome the stinginess, perhaps, or the anger so I can contain myself and tolerate. If people insult me, I won't yell back. No, because we all have weaknesses. So David Melech teaches us that he himself had certain weaknesses, he himself made mistakes, and we've talked about it in the past, how he admits it, how he talks about it, how he understands that uh, Hashem is very forgiving, and he's not taking advantage of that attribute of God that Hashem is very forgiving, because he's only forgiving to those who are sincere, and we will see how sincere David HaMelech really is. He, he's not just an average individual, he's a very, very righteous man, and this prayer, the rabbis tell us, is Le David. Specifically so, it's for David because he stands out apart, very different than all the other kings. In the way he conducted himself, in his relationship with Hashem. So he said, Tefillah, this is a prayer of David. It's coming from David, not an ordinary individual. So he's asking here for himself, but he's also in saying that this is a prayer to David, the commentaries say that he's also asking for his descendants. Very important detail, that when we pray, we have to pray for our children too. It's very nice and very important and correct to pray for oneself, not to assume that everything will be the same tomorrow. And I'm going to explain that soon. The difference between a prayer before something happens versus a prayer as something happens is happening. One that is before the tzara and one that is during the tzara. They're very, very different types of prayers. And here, similarly, there is a prayer for oneself and there's a prayer for Yotzei Chalatzam, for his descendants, for his children. Very important. Mothers would make that prayer before they would light the candles for Shabbat, which is Isman Mesugal et Ratzon, it's a propitious time to pray. There are certain times that are more propitious than others, we know that. And uh, right before lighting the candles is one of those times. So the Vila is asking for his children. Now why is he asking for his children? Not only is that a normal thing to do and a very important thing to do, the Vila through his Ruach HaKodesh, through the divine inspiration, knows that some of those children will not be good will not be righteous. We're not just talking about his children, we're talking about even future kings, descendants of David. If all you have to do is read Sefer Melachim, the book of kings, and realize that very few were righteous, very few were good, righteous, and devoted to doing the right thing. Unfortunately, they were trapped, I like to use the word trapped, in the evil inclination that existed back then, a power that that uh, misled many of them to worship idols. And we have a hard time understanding idols. What's, what's so attractive or what's so interesting about idols? But we don't know. And in order to impress upon you, if you want to know, if you want to have an idea how powerful that evil inclination is, just look around and, and, and analyze the power of the evil inclination called money. Not that money has, is an evil inclination, but those who are, <laughs> who are very, very much obsessed with it, it becomes for them as an idol. 
And we can see that. We see that all the time, every day. We see people who are obsessed with that and are willing to do almost anything to get their hands on money illegally. And even if they don't get their hands on money, they're dreaming about it day and night. They want it. So the, it, the, it is a very powerful attraction, very powerful force. So it's hard for us to understand what Abu Dazara was, but that's what happened in the past. There was that powerful force that misled misled many Jews, unfortunately, away from the real focus, from the real priority and important thing in life, which is the service of Hashem. So David Melech says, I can see what's happening, I, I can see what's going on, I can see what will be, and I'm praying for them too. So, what is he asking of Hashem? He's going to ask for mercy. He's going to turn to the attribute of mercy, because when you say that you are poor, meaning that you don't have too many merits, then you're appealing to the attribute Midat Rachamim. Because Hashem has various attributes. There is the Din, there is the just judgment, and that can be very harsh. And there is Rachamim, Kadosh Baruch Hu is kind even to those who are not so good. So David Amelech, in his prayer, appeals to Midat Rachamim, and that is why the name of Hashem appears here in Hebrew as Yud Kei Vav Kei. Hate Hashem, it doesn't say Elohim. Hashem, which is Midat HaRachamim. So turn to me, pay close attention to me in the same way that you pay close attention to the poor, more so than to other people. In the following Pesukim, we will see that Avil HaMelech also presents himself as a Hasid, a righteous individual, as somebody that gives his life, is willing to, being prepared to give his life for Hashem, or in this case, as a poor man, or as an Eved, as a servant of Hashem. We see various terms that the Bir Melech used to present himself to Hashem, either like this or like that or like that. And we see that type of presentation or representation in our prayers in the morning, in Shachrit. When different parts of our prayer, we conduct ourselves in, in, in a different way. You know, for example, the Tachanun, the prayer of Tachanun, which is right after the Amidah, is a very important prayer. A lot of people don't even know what it's for, what it does. They'd rather not say it, some of them. Very significant prayer, because it's a, it's a prayer where one is really begging for his life, in a sense. And, and you wonder, what is it doing right after the Amidah, right after the most important prayer of the day? And that is because the Amidah contains so many requests of Hashem. Please give me livelihood and health and just about everything you can think of is in the Amidah. We ask for rain and sustenance. So right after we've made all our personal requests, we say to Hashem, you know, I'm prepared to do anything for you as well. So the Tahanun, which of course is a lot of confession, but it's more than a confession. It's called Nefilat Apaim, the real term for, for Tahanun, where one actually puts his head down, sits down. Very intense prayer. So there's a reason why that prayer is said at that time. And in the various parts of our prayer, we therefore act differently, whether it's standing up or whether it's sitting down, in how we make our request of Hashem or in our praise of Hashem. So that is exactly what you will see in this chapter, in the very first verses, you will see how he calls himself. So for example, in verse 2, Pasuk Bet, Shamera nafshi ti hasid ani. He's asking that Hashem guard his soul because he is a Hasid, a pious. That's, I guess, the best translation for Hasid. You're a pious? What makes you pious? So the commenters explained that one of the qualities that made him a pious was the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that he admitted his wrongs. He's not coming to Hashem and just making all these requests. He is admitting his wrongs. But also because he would wake up early in the morning and he would learn Torah and he would pray. And most kings wouldn't do that. They all sleep late in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then they have their coffee, <laughs> then their cigarette perhaps. Mm -hmm. right? Who prays? So he's calling, he says, Hashem, compare me to all the other kings. I'm a Hasid. So you see, he's using that also to describe a little bit of how he conducts himself during the day. Hosha Abdecha so he continues on to say, deliver or save or help 
that's the word Hosha. Abdecha, your servant. See, now he says, your servant. You are, my God, deliver your servant who trusts in you. Usually you would say, Abotech Bach, here for somebody that you know, trusts in you. But here it says, Abotech Elecha, towards you. So the commentaries explain that he's using the word Elecha because he says, not only did I deal with it till now, I will do so in the future as well. Abotech Elecha, therefore, continuously. And that is very important because sometimes life takes a turn. There's ups and downs. Sometimes people do well, sometimes people don't do well financially and otherwise. And if you trust Hashem, it has to be even during the hard times, not just during the good times. You will hear in Israel some people claim all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Yes, Elohim! <laughs> There's God! <laughs> when? When their team made a goal. <laughs> <laughs> their team made a goal, Yes, Elohim! There's God, God exists. But if the other team made a goal, <laughs> they begin to worry. So true bitachon, trust in Hashem, is when a person understands that everything is for the good. It does not mean that he, he doesn't have to act. We can't just leave it to Hashem. There's sometimes a need for us to do something about the situation. That's called in Hebrew, hishtadlut. We make an effort, whether it is to go to the doctor, whether it is to hire an attorney, whether it is to speak to someone. There's a need to involve ourselves in something to hopefully uh, see results. But we don't forget the prayer. Prayer is the most important tool that we have. We turn to Hashem directly because we realize that He can provide all the help and all the answers. He has messengers, so we have to turn to the messengers. And the greater the individual is, on the higher level he is, he will see open miracles, he will see the shortcuts that he can take, and hopefully it will avoid many, many pitfalls in that land with the wrong attorney who will charge him, as I say in English, an arm and a leg, and maybe even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people just, you know, don't get the best help they can. That's only Shemaim. That's all part of the kapara, part of the atonement. So David Amelech is turning to Hashem and saying, Hasidani, compare me to everybody else, and I'm pious. But why say that? What's the purpose of that? Help me out. He says, deliver your servant. I trust in you. The need for this is because sometimes there are many kitrugim. A lot of times there's a lot of accusations from above on an individual. That he did this, he did that. He wasn't nice to this person. Whatever. All kinds of accusations from above. And they are aware of everything. Everything is documented. Everything that we, we did, everything that we've spoken of, is documented. And these things can act against us. These uh, mistakes of ours, whether they were intentional or not, makes no difference. You know, when you are driving and you made a mistake, you're still going to get a ticket. Unless the policeman is nice to you. and tells you, okay, be careful next time. But depending what it was, whether it was intentional or not, you have to pay. So there are kitrugin, there are accusations. So important to confess them, to understand that they were wrong, and of course to, to take steps to remedy the problem. If a person does not take upon himself, uh, does not make a commitment to repair uh, what he did wrong, then he's not going to be able to advance. His prayer won't be as effective. A lot of people have troubles, and they don't realize that during the time of trouble, this is a time to make a commitment. This is a time either to repair something that is not right, or to undertake something that may perhaps has not been done before. A commitment, a neder, a, a vow, a promise of some sort, to do something special. Because this may be the only tool to, that is available to us to be able to win our case in court, in the heavenly court. So David Amelik is saying, you know, I confess, I realize I'm not perfect, but please take into consideration that I'm a Hasid, I'm I have trust in you. This counts. Midata bitachon, this quality that we call trusting in Hashem is very, very powerful. Hashemayim, they say, He trusts us. In other words, Hashem says He trusts me. He trusts in me. 
So therefore, for that alone, he may be rewarded. So he, he's sharing with us these various details, qualities, that can be helpful in one's prayer. If you have the time, you will notice there was Ani, there was Hasid, pious, Abdecha servant, there is uh, oh, these are various actually these, these are the, the categories or levels that he presents himself the seven terms that he uses or the seven ways that he turns to Hashem are as follows that's one Shamran Afshi, that was guard my soul, is number two. Hosha, save or deliver me, is number three. Choneni, that was be gracious, as we will soon see. Sameach, gladden me. Hazinat, Vakshiva, listen to my prayers. So the various terms that he uses to turn to Hashem, that he accepts his prayer. Why seven? It just turns out to be seven. Seven, you know, is a very special number. It's a holy number. It could be referring, corresponding to the seven attributes of Hashem. It could be referring to the seven heavens. You know, Kabbalistically, on a deeper level, the, the seven has definitely great meaning. The commentaries don't talk too much about that, but it's something that is quite noticeable, and there's a reason for it. I think that it's talking about the sefirot, I mean, the attributes of Hashem, perhaps. And as we will soon see, one of those attributes, not, I'm not talking about the sefirot necessarily, but the attributes of Hashem. The 13 attributes of Hashem. So even though you have 13, he may be referring to some of those as well. So either the sefirot, it could be referring to the sefirot, which are the lower ones are seven, or it could be referring to some of the attributes of Hashem in the way he conducts himself in this world, that he's compassionate and he's tolerant, forgiving, and emet, he's truthful, which I think fits in very well with one of the verses that we will talk about soon. Be gracious to me, calling on the Shem, for to you I call all day, Hanina, as it's called in Hebrew, to be gracious, even if a person does not deserve it, he's asking that Hashem be gracious with him. Why? Why should I be gracious with you? So earlier, when he said Hasid Ali, the word Hasid is very, very special. What makes somebody a Hasid? So we said before that the fact that he's admitting his faults that's very special too, but that in itself does not make him a Hasid. It's just one of the qualities of a Hasid. A Hasid is also an individual who hears an insult and does not insult back. In other words, he swallows his pride. To hear an insult, a klala, a curse, and not say anything and just to keep quiet, that's very, very powerful. So that's one form of Hasid or another quality of a pious individual. Another possible description of a chassid that he, that he does rifni meshurat adin. He does, uh, he goes beyond the letter of the law. He's not insisting on him always being right. He's, he gives in. That's also called a chassid. So there's various qualities involved in this term called chassid. So he uses this because he He's telling Hashem, I may not have too many deeds, but at least I'm a Hasid. Look at some of those qualities. Perhaps they can make a difference. Does Hashem need to be reminded of them? We're dealing with a court. Sometimes we don't realize it, but Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. Yes, that's when they look at our books and they analyze our deeds, but throughout the year, there's a mini judgment happening actually every night before we go to sleep. That's why we should say some vidui to confess what, because sometimes there's a mini judgment. 
And that mini judgment determines what will happen at night during the dream, if the dreams are good or not. That will determine how the day will, will the next day will follow. It may not be major events that will occur because those major events are decided on Rosh Hashanah. Nonetheless, there's a mini judgment, and those mini judgments can make a difference. So, the Vira Melech says, please let those few qualities or merits that I may have speak up for me. Why now, more than ever, why don't you wait? And this is a very important idea. The reason why David Melech, in this chapter, makes uh, th these requests, why he puts so much, so much of an emphasis on the tefillah, even though he already did so several times, is because he's teaching us that one of the most effective prayers, if, if you want to you want Hashem to answer your prayers is to ask for something spiritual in nature. He's asking for a davar ruchani. He's asking for help with his yetzerara, for example, with his evil inclination. Anytime an individual asks for something that is spiritual, there's a better chance that his prayers will be heard. If he asks for something physical, like, you know, I need to find a job. That's another example of something physical. They scrutinize much more his deeds. Somebody says, Hashem, I want to get married. Well, what is that? Is marriage something physical or spiritual? It depends how you treat it. If you tell Hashem, the only reason I want to get married is because I want to establish a home for you. So that the, the next generation will come and observe you. So this is only for you. It's not for me. You know, it's, that's not the main idea behind my request. So when the whole attitude of the, the request is geared towards pleasing Hashem, it transforms it into a spiritual request. But if you're being selfish about it, something that you want for your comfort, and for your serenity, uh, so that you can be happy with a wife and a home and kids just like everybody else, and that's something more selfish. Nothing wrong with that, but sometimes there's kitrugim, or as we said, there are accusations, and we want to overcome those accusations. One way is by transforming the request into something more spiritual. So if it's all about, Hashem, help me learn Torah. It's very hard for me to sit down. Find me a, a good teacher. These are all spiritual requests. Find me a good friend that I can share my troubles with, that will listen to me. And, you know, This is spiritual request. As long as it's for a good cause that is spiritual, there is a better chance that those requests will be heard. So. This is one of the details that David Amelech here will emphasize that what is this request all about? Here it has nothing to do with winning at war. I want to win the battle. I want to crush the enemy. No, nothing of that nature. It's about survival, but not physical so much as spiritual. Because he's aware of the evil inclination, he's aware of the many challenges that lie ahead. For every human being, no matter how great they are, people can fall, people have failed. And that is part of his request here. So, be gracious to me, because I will call out to you all day long. All day long, always. I'm not going to stop. I will continue to pray, realizing the importance of prayer. Next, Pasuk Sameach Nefesh Abdecha Kilecha Adonai Nafshi Esa. Bring joy to the soul of your servant for you. For to you, my, lo my Lord, or Hashem, I lift my soul. So Sameach Nefesh Adecha, this is how you will make me happy. In other words, if you help me out with these requests, you will make my Nefesh happy. Nefesh is the soul, not the body. So, forgive the sins, of course, that will also make him happy. But here, he's asking for the prayer to be answered, which in turn will make his Nefesh happy. David Amelech, as a king, was very, very troubled and very occupied with all kinds of things. He's a king. And he realizes that perhaps because of all his commitments and responsibilities, his prayer could not be a normal prayer. He could not focus as well. He could not concentrate. So he's asking for Hashem to help. Help me so I don't have all these troubles. That will enable me to pray to you with more kavanah, with more focus. And that, in turn, will make me happy. So this is the consequence of getting rid of all his troubles, that he will be happy. Because I will lift my soul to you. This is 
also a way of saying, I depend on you. I turn to you and not to anybody else. Also a very important idea is that even though we do turn to other people, we continuously need to remind ourselves that the one who really can help is Hashem. And he could be a very simple individual who will be the messenger, or he could be somebody uh, in a very high position. We don't know. So we have to try our best, but we must realize at all time that the help we're getting is really from Shammai, from above. Next Pasuk. This is a very famous Pasuk, a very interesting one. If you follow the words literally, it means that you, Hashem, are good and forgiving. And are very, very exceedingly kind. Rav Hesed Lechol Korecha to all those who call upon you. Hashem is good. Hashem is forgiving. So the rabbis tell us the reason that David Melech says that is because he's reminding us that Hashem in himself, his essence is all about goodness. The whole creation is an act of kindness and goodness of Hashem. And because he's good, he is forgiving. Why is he forgiving? Because he's good. So Tov and Salach. Goodness and forgiving go together. He's good, therefore he's forgiving. Why is he forgiving? Because he's good. So that is the characteristic of goodness, of a good person, too. He's forgiving to others who may have wronged him. So Hashem has that me done, and of course he wants us to emulate him. So Hashem, you are good and forgiving, and Rav Hesed, exceedingly kind. The word Rav Hesed is used even to describe situations or people who may not deserve it. That's what chesed is all about. Chesed is even with those who may not deserve it. Hashem ma'arich af. Hashem is tolerant because it could be that Hashem, only Hashem can know this, that someday this individual will do teshuvah, will repent. So Hashem says, why should I punish him now? I know the future. Or I know that he will have good children. So I'm not going to punish him right now. If he does not do teshuvah, I have an account with him later on, in the afterlife perhaps. So all of this is chesed, that Hashem gives people a chance, that Hashem takes into consideration the children. Hashem considers many, many things. A mortal, human judge cannot do so. Imagine a woman coming to the judge and her husband is going to sit 25 years in jail. Uh, Your Honor, you know, you're making me a living widow. Living, you know, because her husband is not dead. You're causing the children to be orphans and not to have their father for 25 years. What is the judge going to say? I'm sorry, lady, but he broke the law. There's no compassion. There's no nothing. I can't consider that, but Hashem does. Hashem is, of course, very, very different than human beings. He knows everything. He's aware of everything. He knows to what degree the the offense was committed, was, was it knowingly, not knowingly, how much education the person had. Hashem considers everything. We don't have the capability whatsoever to understand Hashem's ways. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu, that's one of the things he asked, and the Vila Melech also wants to know. Hashem, please tell me your ways, teach me your ways, how you conduct business in this world. You know, why is it that the evil prosper and the righteous suffer? Can you give me a little bit, a few lessons in that? And Hashem says, you will never understand while you're alive. You cannot know my ways. So much is taken into consideration. Reincarnations is also another idea that uh, is more elaborated on in the Kabbalah that is considered. You know, perhaps something was done in a previous lifetime. So Hashem is very kind. Very kind even to those who may not deserve it for reasons that only he knows. The fact, the rabbis tell us, the fact that there's something called Teshuvah is already indicative of all the kindness that Hashem bestows upon us. He allows Teshuvah. Now obviously if somebody murdered someone, Teshuvah alone is not enough because you can't bring back the person. But still the Teshuvah helps. It is very, very different if an individual left this world with Teshuvah versus no Teshuvah at all. It makes a big difference. That is why we have the custom of going over to somebody who's on his deathbed and helping him say the Vidui. It will help him a lot. 
at least confess, at least say you're sorry. It, it helps. He still needs an atonement, depending on what he did, but it, it helps. Next, Pasuk. We've seen this before that many times in Tehilim and elsewhere there are words that appear to be synonymous. What's the difference? To many people they're the same, but they're not the same. In Hebrew there's such a thing as a synonym, a real synonym. No, each one has a different connotation. A slightly different meaning. One can be from a far dist, from a greater distance. One could be closer. You hear something close to you. You hear something from a distance. <clears throat> Just like there is a difference between a shkifa and a bit, to look, to stare, to look down, to look up. There's different words in Hebrew, Lashon Hakodesh, to describe those actions. So here, David Amalek is asking, Azina, pay close attention, Hashem, to my prayer. And listen to the voice of my supplications, because he's pleading now with Hashem. So what's the difference between the two? Very important difference here. Here it is where he's telling us that it makes a difference whether one is going to pray or ask of Hashem something before it happens, versus asking for Hashem's help while he's in distress and in trouble. So the tefillah, and many of the tefillah that we say every day, are before. Before anything can happen that will go wrong, we ask Hashem for all kinds of things. For example, we ask Hashem refayenu, even if somebody is healthy, no one is sick in the family, Hashem, cure us. Who should I cure? <laughs> no one is ill. In the event that somebody will become ill, please, we turn to you because we realize that you are the Rofe Kol Basar Mafrila, so in the end it is you who is the real doctor, who heals everyone. <clears throat> so the tefillah that we say on a daily basis for things that may happen or that we may have a need for is very important because at that time that we don't have the need, there is no kitrukim, there is no accusations. Once a person is already be'et sara, then he's akshiva be'kol tachanunotai, then we're asking Hashem, please, Listen to our pleading, to our supplications. When? When you are already in Etzarat and you need Hashem's to listen to you. Tahanunim. You have to beg now. You have to work a lot harder in overcoming those accusations. It's not easy. Once a person is in trouble, the prayer alone may not do it. That is what the rabbis tell us. No dream be Etzarat. A person is in Etzarat, he's drowning. The ship is capsizing. Make a nether, Hashem, if you get me out of this somehow, I promise you that I will do this, something very special, of course. Not I will give $10 to Tzedakah. No, $10. Something very, very special. If he hasn't been praying every day, I will pray every single day, three times a day. I will go to the shul, the synagogue. I will have an open house to anybody that needs a meal. Something that's very, very special. Especially if he never did it before, never. Because he, you know, didn't like to do something, whatever. So if he does something that is impressive, that could help, that can save the day. Somebody's in trouble, he's about to go into jail. Somebody's about to go through surgery where there's a 50-50 chance he will stay alive. These are called et sara. These are very, very difficult, troubling times. Make a very powerful commitment and that may help more than anything else. The prayer is good, important. And obviously we always need to pray. But it may not be enough be'et sara at a time of distress and trouble. And that is why he divides up this pasuk vav between ahazin Hashem, the prayer, at all times, before the tzara, and akshiva, and listen to the voice, the call of tahanut of my supplications, where one is already begging, if there is a need for that already. Be'yom sarati ekra'eka ki ta'aneni. And that is an example of what we just said. In the day of my distress, tzara is distress or trouble, I will call to you, Kitani, because you will answer me. Who says you will answer me? <laughs> so David Melch, of course, has experience. He knows that Hashem answers him. 
a real righteous individual, a pious individual, Hashem will answer him. Especially if it's something spiritual. So that's why, because we're talking more about spiritual requests, that is why he's saying, I know you will answer me. What am I asking for? I want a bigger home in Beverly Hills. <laughs> no, he's asking for spiritual matters. Protect me, you know, from sin, from all these troubles that uh, are always, you know, interfering with, with his uh, service of Hashem, that to not let him to pray or to perhaps to learn. So when he's in trouble, he's not necessarily asking just to get rid of that trouble, to be protected from that trouble. He, he wants to be able to focus on the Avodah of Hashem, on the service of Hashem. He wants to be a better Jew. He wants to maximize his potential. And therefore, he knows that Hashem, for that type of request, will answer him. The fact that he says Taneni is also a very important reminder to us that prayer matters. Prayer is a very important tool. And that is why we attribute to it much importance in Judaism. We believe that it can help. So the fact that he says Kitaneni reminds us, yes, there is a chance that you will see miracles. And then many people have many, many stories to say about the miracles that they experienced. <clears throat> There's not like you among this, the various kings in the world or powers and there are no deeds like yours. Who can do all these miracles? No one can perform miracles except for Hashem. So here he reminds us of the fact that yes, miracles can occur. And if anybody can do a miracle, it's only Hashem. So there's nothing else in the world. Those who have any doubts about it, that's what the Vila Melech says here. He reminds us, Hashem can do it. If anybody can do it, Hashem can do it. Rabbis give us a beautiful example about there's no one that can do what you do. <clears throat> they say like this, a human being, if he opens up his drawer and he sees an unpaid bill, somebody owes him money, he'll take it right away and remind the guy who owes him money, here it is, you still owe it to me, I found it. If he has in his drawer a bill that has been paid, he will not show it. Even though somebody is asking for it, he would, he's not going to volunteer the information so easily because it's been paid. So he, what benefit does he get from it? Let the guy who owes prove that he paid. So a human being may have that uh, temptation of, if it's coming to me, you owe it to me, to show it. And the temptation not to show something that has been paid. Hashem is not like that. If you owe him, in other words, there is a sin out there, kovesh avonot, Hashem will put it away, not show it necessarily. And if there's some zechut, some merit that he may not be aware of, Hashem will take it out of the drawer. This is in, for you. This is in your favor. You see the difference? En secha. Down here below in this world, there's no one that behaves this way, conducts himself this way. Very nice example. Next pasuk, Kol goyim asher asita yavu v'shtachamu l'fanecha v'noi b'chabedu l'shemecha. Talking about the future, saying all the nations that you have made will eventually, very soon, will come and bow down before you, Hashem, my Lord, and give honor to your name. Right now, they don't believe in a God or in one God who is all-powerful, who performs miracles. Not everybody does. In the end, even those that denied it believed in evolution and all kinds of other theories that have nothing to do with the Supreme Being. They will come to that realization and bow down before you and give honor to your name. So from time to time, David Melech does that. He tells us a little bit about what the future will be like. At the end of days, when Mashiach comes, things will be very, very different. <coughs> right now, people don't have that strong emunah or any emunah faith in Hashem. But it, that will change very soon. What will change? They will realize that this God, not only did He create the world, He has been around Mashgiach. He's been involved in this world as well. Because otherwise, why would He listen to our prayers? There are some who believe that a God created the world. Who says He listens? Who says He's involved? So 
they're going to realize that this guy who created the world, he's been in charge all along. He's been watching, supervising. And, of course, would have listened to your prayers had you prayed to him sincerely. Next, Ki gadol You are great and perform wonders. You alone, God. Nobody else can perform the wonders. Very important idea to remind ourselves that Hashem performs miracles, not just in the past, we heard about them, but even in the present, that which we, what we said in Hanukkah, Bayamim Ahem, Basman Azeh. We're asking for miracles to be seen in our time as well. And we have seen miracles, but there are a lot of people who don't acknowledge it. They, they would rather say, ah, oh, this is an act of nature, this is just by chance, this is a freak accident. No. Only you alone can perform these miracles. Pasuk Yud Aleph 11 Oreni Adonai Darkecha Halech Bamitecha Yachel Levabili Rashemecha. So here's asking that Hashem teach him. Teach me your ways. As I said before, this is a similar request to what Moshe made. Teach me your ways. Why you do certain things. Halech Bamitecha that I may walk in your truth. Yachel Levabili Rashemecha and unify my heart to fear you, to fear your name. So here he clarifies what his request is all about. I want to be able to know the ways of Hashem. And it's not necessarily only the ways of Hashem above, but also that I do not stumble in this world. Shiloi kashel. So Hashem, show me your ways. I don't want to stumble. I don't want to make a mistake. All of this is spiritual. When people say, in the, in the end of the prayers, Elokain netzor leshoni mera. Guard my tongue from speaking evil, from saying la shonara, from gossiping. What we're saying is we're asking Hashem for help. You know, I don't want to be tempted. There's a lot of situations people don't realize that we're asking for Hashem for spiritual guidance, spiritual help. Because the Yetzirah is very powerful and uh, very tempting sometimes. So, Oren Hashem Darkecha, show me the way, guide me, Alech Bamitecha, so that I should be able to walk truthfully in your way, 100%, without being distracted. That's what Amitecha means. Yached Levavili Rashemecha, unify my heart. Why should I unify? What does it mean, unify my heart? Yes, because sometimes people's heart is divided between their business and God. <laughs> God, I have time for you only in the morning and at night. They don't realize that even when you do business, you can do it l'shem shamayim. You know, I'm working here so that I can pay the bills and provide for my kids to go to a Jewish school. Then that work is sanctified. You can think of Hashem even doing the work when you are setting a good example of honesty. You know, you don't do something, you refuse to do something which is wrong. So that's business too. So that's called Halech Bamitecha, and that's called Yached Levavili Rashemecha. Unify me to fear you and only you, nobody else. So in order for one's conduct to be 100% right, you need Hashem's help. So this is an example of the requests that David Melech made for himself and that we should continuously ask for. Some say Bamitecha also includes Allow me to understand your chokhmah, your wisdom, your truth, the deeper wisdom. But the main idea here is that we're asking for Hashem's help that we should not be distracted from what we really need to do, from doing the right things. <coughs> so I will praise you with all my heart and I will give honor to your name forever. Also a very significant idea. He's basically saying, since I'm a king and I don't have the time sometimes, I'm asking you to help me in doing this, and that is to thank you with all my heart, to give you honor all the time. I don't want to be distracted or interrupted. Enable me to be able to focus on you. Here he recognizes that you've, your kindness to me has been great. You saved me from Sheol, from the depths of the grave. He's recognizing the fact that in the past Hashem has helped him, has saved him, has spared him, has been kind to him. So in the same way that you've 
done so in the past, I'm asking that you do so in the future. And that is why we say, we make various blessings in thanking Hashem for a miracle, whether somebody just got out of an accident, or he was involved in a very dangerous uh, incident of sorts. We have to recognize the fact that Hashem spared us. We were saved, we make a blessing for that. And we're asking Hashem, please be there for us in the future too. You've been kind to us, you've, been, you've saved in the past from temptation, from all kinds of situations where I was challenged spiritually. That is why he uses the word grave here. Misha'ol. It's not necessarily from physical death, but from spiritual death, God forbid, which is worse. Elohim Zedim kamu alai vadat aritzim bikshu nafshi velo samuch velo samuch ale negdam. Here he's saying, God, malicious men, Zedim, evil people, Zedim. They have risen against me in Adat Aritzim. Ada is like a band, a group of Aritzim, of uh, people who are ruthless. They have no pity. Are called Aritzim. Bikshunavshi, they sought my soul. They weren't mindful of you. They didn't consider you. People who are murderers, people who hurt people, people who do harm to others usually don't don't have any rachamayim. That's what he's saying. These people who are not God-fearing people are capable of doing terrible things to others. Lo samucha lenegdam is a very important idea that when you're dealing with such people who have no yirat Hashem, as we saw in the Torah, what does Abraham say, what does Isaac say when they both conceal the fact that the wife was not their wife? Oh, she's my sister. Why say that? We were concerned that there's no yirat elokim ba makom azeh. There's no fear of heaven in this place. They're going to kill us and take away the wife. So, no, she's my sister. <laughs> so, when people do not consider you, they don't have any respect for you, we're, we're in trouble. If we're, dealing, we're having to deal with this. So, that's what the Vietnam says. These are the type of people that I had to deal with in the past. But what happened in the past with the most dangerous people? Here he introduces those attributes that we've been talking about. That Hashem, but you are compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and truth. So, as a result of that, you know, you protected my life from these individuals. So he's asking now, by reminding himself of all those attributes of Hashem is help me in the future that I should be able to continue to observe your mitzvot and not be tempted to do sin. And, and the word ve'emet, truth, means that after all, you, you keep your promises. You reward the, the righteous. That's what the word emet means. The attribute of truth means that Hashem is always truthful in what He says, which includes protecting the tzaddikim. So therefore, the emet, the last one, is right before the next verse that says, Pnei elai v'choneni t'na'u zecha le'avdecha v'oshia le'ven ha'metecha. Turn to me and be gracious to me and grant your strength to your servant and deliver the son of your maidservant. Another very interesting idea. Why maidservant? So we understand why he, what he's saying. Turn to me, help me, give me the strength that I will need to do what? To do battle with the evil inclination. Because the rabbis tell us this is something that will go on for the rest of a person's life, even on his deathbed, the evil inclination will not let go of him. It will come to him. So I need that strength to be able to do battle in the future. Who says just because I won in the past I will win again? But why levena matecha? Why give that strength or help the son of your maidservant? So some say the maidservant is on a lower level than a regular servant. He's the son of a maidservant, which is even though I'm in the lowest level, please help me. But others say that he's talking of the Zohar actually says that from here you see that when somebody is very sick, you mention his name and his mother's name. Right? Remember that? Not the father. You can mention the father's name, but the mother's name is more for sure that this is his mother. And when somebody is sick, it's not an Aliyah la Torah. I'm talking about a, a, a situation where somebody is sick, you mention his mother's name. The Zohar says so. So it could be that here in saying Ben Amitecha, he's, he's trying to emphasize the fact, you know, 
the son of your maidservant, even though Hashem knows, of course, who everybody is. But the Zohar says so, so I'm including that interpretation here too. And the last verse of this chapter is, Show me a sign of favor so that my enemies will, should see and be ashamed. For Hashem, you have given me the aid. You have consoled me. So here he's asking that in, in the end, let the enemy see that you have shown me favor, that you have forgiven me, and they will therefore be embarrassed because a lot of his enemies, learned people, were saying, oh, he's a sinner, he will never be forgiven, he has no share to the world to come, he's a goner. And that was tremendous shame. And if these were people in any position of power, they had influence over others too. So he's asking for that desecration of Hashem's name to be eliminated, that there should be a Kiddush Hashem, that he was always right, that Hashem has always been with him. So it's, it's not for him, it's really for the sake of Hashem, for, for, the, for the sake of the, of the truth, that people should realize that they were mistaken all along, and they will be embarrassed as a result. Yes, that's what will happen to many nations in the world too, when they realize the truth. So he's asking for that, because that is ultimately what needs to come out, the truth. So chapter 87, just a few pesukim real quickly. As I said before, the, ver the, the special power of this is to help a city or community if they need some sort of help. This is a beautiful chapter, just a few pesukim being said by the sons of Korach. A song devoted to the holy mountains of Yerushalayim, Yisudato Behar HaRekodesh, the various mountains, Har Tzion, Har Amoriyah, Har Zetim. This is a focus about a place called Yerushalayim, a special place, special mountains, special air, just everything is special about that city, and that is why Hashem chose that location for the Bet HaMikdash. That's what this chapter is all about. Ohev Adonai Sharet Tzion Mikol Mishkenot Yaakov. Hashem loves the gates of Tzion more than all the dwelling places of Yaakov. There may be a lot of Batek Neset, a lot of Batek Midrashot, a lot of places of learning and prayer all over the world. Hashem says, yes, but my palace is here. <laughs> in other words, in Yerushalayim. That is my preferred place. Rabbis tell us also, Sharet Tzion refers to Sharim HaMetsuyanim Be'alacha, those gates that are, that excel in Halacha. Halacha is very important, that people know how to conduct themselves according to the Halacha, according to the Torah. More so than all the Mishkenot Yaakov, Batek Neset, and Batek Midrash. People just, you know, lead their lives without learning halakha. They're going to be making many mistakes. We have to learn halakha. And Hashem says, that is what I love, especially when there's no Bet HaMikdash today. What is left? Sharim HaMetsuyanim Ba'alakha. Dalet Amot Shul Halakha. Places where halakha is taught, so people know right from wrong. Hashem says, I prefer that. That is more important to me than all the Mishkenot, houses of prayer of Yaakov. Nichbadot medubar bachira Elohim Sela. So many glorious things have been, have been spoken of you, this city of God, the eternal city of God. Yushalayim has many good qualities. We don't have the time right to list them, but Yushalayim as a city, as a place, not only because of its geography, but because of its holiness, has a lot of good qualities. Whoever lives there you can live anywhere in Israel, but Yushalayim has special qualities, and that is, as I said, why the Bet HaMidash was built for some reason there. And that is why he's bringing out over here that... The, the glorious things about it will be discussed very, very soon when Mashiach comes. Everybody will talk about it. Nichbadot metubarbach. Many good things and glorious things will be spoken about you. But the main glorious thing about it is that this is where the Shekhinah resides. This is the home of Hashem. The next Pasuk is very, very funny and interesting. And I, I guarantee you that most people go through it, read through it, and don't even know what they're saying. I'm surprised that there's not much more talk about it, but it really goes together with Dalet Hay and Vav all going through together. So I'm going to read it to you first. Askir Rahab Ubaveli Yodai, Hinek Veleshet Vetsorim Kush Zeyulat Sham. If you just read it literally, it's, it's hard to understand what he's saying. I will remind Rahab, Rahab is Egypt, in Babylon, concerning Yodai, my beloved, those who know me. I will remind them. Felashet, Philistia, Tzor, Tyre, Kush, either India or Ethiopia. Zeyulat Sham, I will remind him, hey, you see this Jew that lives with you, that lives in your country? He's, he's Jewish. 
even though that Jew may not know it, even though the non-Jew may not know it, when Mashiach comes, this is what he's saying, Hashem will point out, hey, you guys, you nations, Zeyulat Sham, this Jew was born or belongs in Yerushalayim. Bring him over. Hashem will turn to Tzion and say, this person, and that was born there, and he will establish it. It was the Most High will establish it. The Kadosh Baruch Hu will establish the city, even though the city is being built today. Yerushalayim looks beautiful. It still does not have a Bet Hamidash. The real building of Jerusalem is when the, set, the temple, the Bet Hamidash, is built. So that is happening at the time when Hashem will point out all those that may have disappeared in a sense, and that we don't even know, and they don't even know that Jewish. He belongs there. He's from there. He was born there. Bring him. And then. Midrash actually says, and actually the prophets even talk about it, that all the nations of the world will bring the Jews, send the Jews. The Midrash says they will bring gifts to Mashiach, and Mashiach is going to say, I don't need these gifts, bring me my children. Those are my gifts. You want to bring me a gift? And they will bring. And they will bring those that only Hashem knows are Jewish. And Hashem therefore will point them out. As another verse says, no one will be abandoned, no one will be forgotten. That's all in other prophecies that are said, but this is basically what this chapter is all about. In speaking about the importance of Shulayim and those that belong there, that eventually they will all come there, and Hashem will build it up. He will count in the register of the people. This individual was born there. And when that happens, all my singers as well as dancers will sing your praise. All my inner thoughts are of you. They will all realize, all, all the nations, when they come and bring the Jews, that Hashem's inner thoughts have always been with us. And this is, of course, all during the time of Mashiach, when things will be very, very clear to everyone, but will not be so clear yet to those who did not even know that they're Jewish. So there are other prophecies to say that Hashem will point them out, bring them, include them, in the Jewish nation as well. This is, of course, uh, an incredible thing that people are not realizing that because we're afraid of assimilation, of, and rightfully so. Assimilation into marriage is detrimental. It was always a big problem and, and a threat to, to Jewish survival. But Hashem says, but I am aware of all the souls. I am aware of where everyone is. And there is something called an ingathering of all the children to Israel which does not only include the 12 tribes, but the Zat Hashem will also include all those who we forgot about, who they themselves do not realize, they too, the Zat Hashem will come back. Amen.